The next speaker I'd like to welcome up to the podium is Christoph Linder. He is an assistant professor of anthropology and an archaeologist in residence at Bard College. Um, he holds a PhD from SUNY Albany and specializes in the archaeohistorical landscape, investigation, and experimental useware analysis of ancient tools. Among his many publications are a chapter in the book, The Environmental History of the Hudson Valley, and a chapter titled Guinea Town in the Hudson Valley's Hyde Park in the Archaeology of Race in the Northeast. He is also the director of Bard Archaeology's Field School for college community and high school students in the summer and maintains projects at the prehistoric fort site at Bard and at the 18th and 19th century parsonage in Germantown. Um, Chris also serves as a scientific consultant in, the, in environmental impact studies and planning for the protection of cultural resources in the Mid-Hudson Valley. He is uh, past president of the New York Archaeological Council, the state's professional organization, and former president of Hudson River Heritage, the historic preservation group for advocacy and education. He has also brought, brought, brought a wonderful poster with him today um, and, and some students as well, but uh, I, I draw your attention to the poster in the back of the room and recommend that you see it um, during the, one of the breaks and ask Chris and his students about the poster. So um, welcome, uh, Chris. Thank you, Meredith, Peter, Chris, Michael, for uh, what you've said so far. The household of a certain German Calvinist minister in the late 18th century included several enslaved people around whom a community arose by 1830 a neighborhood of just a few families, and lasted 80 years, leaving us vestiges of ritualized centering by the position of emplacements with symbolic directionality in Germantown, New York. In the central valley of the Hudson River, north of the highlands and the cave for Kingston on this map, between the Catskill Mountains, close to the river, and the Taconic foothills, east of the upper Hudson estuary. As seen in this locational image, from the poster by Bard fourth-year student Ethan Dickerman and me for the International Conference in Boston last month. The whole poster has increasingly finer-grained spatial frames, west rightward across the top, with background information down the side and a view of the cellar hearth excavations life size, as though we had x-ray vision to see only the probable spiritually charged items, not quite all of them objects of daily life, in clusters at a southwest position beneath each front hearthstone. That hearth is behind this blank wall in a turn of the century photo of the 1860s house, has adjacent to it two lines of white fence posts between which rests buried a dry laid stone well. An earlier root cellar from the 1740s also filled in rests to the left beside the road. Taken from this photo, a bicentennial greeting card by the house's historic preservationists. Mistakenly shows only one line of posts along the road, but reveals in the center a door they replaced with a window to protect their antique collection. If we entered through that door, we'd stand in front of the hearth. Here seen just before excavation began. The wooden fireplace frame, not fully painted over on the left, has on its right three symbolic figures hidden by the paint, except a close examination under raking light. We'll skip the middle figure of a sailboat that's barely visible through that waterproof paint invented in the late 1800s, but instead we'll look at the lowest figure first and then the top one. The Cosmogram, 
its sunrise birth moment on the right, heavily marked, and another hole repeatedly fixed on the lower left, outside the sector of death and transformation into a venerable ancestor. The upper right's wide northeastern arc of the first day of four in the Bakango week, the ascendancy of spiritual power propitious for planting and burial. The lower left sector is for healing. All originate from the cross's center where one communicates with beings below and above and within. The, top, the pipe at top, its bowl having a punctate decoration like the West African pipes near Williamsburg in the Chesapeake with rubbing into the wood to symbolize ascending smoke. Now to look more steeply downward at the hearthstones as seen in the poster, keeping an eye on the tilted slab below the hanging kettle. We see the clusters at each southwest corner of a front hearthstone. Then to look closely just at the northeastern cluster to the right next to the cosmogram. And oriented northeastward from upper left to lower right, a strip of leather, iron bars, a bone button with copper loop, and a quartz crystal. Of only generalized provenience and so placed in the center of its area is the unusually purplish pebble incised with two crosses, one of them twice. Fish scales predominantly rested under the southern hearthstones, seen in these photomicrographs by bard student Eleanor Stapleton of shad herring, drum, and perch. Also not in that northeast cluster was a leather shoe heel, another crystal, several more buttons, many straight pins, cut nails, and two blue glass beads. The datable pottery is early through middle 19th century. The parsonage last summer, with the circa 1746 well reconstructed after excavation 10 feet down to the aquifer at its base, and one of seven exhibits at the site, a green panel about the, parsonage, the parcels inhabitants and the discovery of their symbolic items in key positions. That panel is a scale map that shows where you are when viewing it, the lower center. The root cellar ghost structure is before you and the reconstructed well toward the top to the north. All the artifacts are life size except the stone knife on the right that may have been left by Mohicans in 1746 when they fled westward from the Hudson Valley. The quartz crystals came from next to the well, inside the cellar, and that an opening into it, deeply buried outside the northeast corner of the cellar was a nearly entire Chinese tea bowl in 29 pieces, a landscape hand painted with water and mountains in the background, which Dr. Paul Huey dates circa 1750 by the quality of its hand-painted design. These concealments were here, on the lower left at the 1746 cellar in this map of the Parsonage's Knoll of Bedrock by Susan Winchell Sweeney. The hearth is to the northeast in the 1767 house and northward from the east wall of the original room of the house were two clusters of iron objects and pottery, numerous white clay pipe fragments, and these astonishing items. Two finger rings, and with an iron bar, possibly an axle, two porcelain front teeth set in vulcanite with platinum pins from the turn of the century according to curator Dr. Scott Swank of the Smithsonian's Museum of Dentistry, in all probability broken with intention near the end of the person family's residence. A photograph taken around the corner from the parsonage circa 1900, the wedding party of the Robinson family's son, Rutherford, a ministry student. Here, had I time, I would recount the several generations of linkages in this vicinity between spiritual and medical practice that we can tie particularly to the African-Americans at the parsonage, the person family. 
Information on the persons can be found in the poster, but also key to their community are several other groups of people referenced by this 1775 map of the central Hudson Valley. In the center above the join there, the Palatine town or the camp, around it, the manor of the Livingstons and that family's act of oppression and enslavement. The Palatines came from the upper Rhine Valley between Bonn and Württemberg and its tributaries such as the Necker shown here at Heidelberg in the mid 1600s. They farmed and grew grapes for Rhine wine until struck by environmental catastrophe, they fled poverty from overtaxation to support the prince's palaces, which you see on the right on the flattened hilltop. Hence the English word palatinate, near the French border, the Rhine Fats. This woodblock print shows them carrying all their belongings and in the background leaving en masse 15,000 strong to seek from Britain free passage and land in the Carolinas. The Palatines camped in army tents for months on the heaths outside London, and while the British government debated their fate, uninvited as they were, at last 3,000 were shipped to New York to harvest pitch pine, to tar the hulls of ships in the British Navy, such as seen here in the 1717 view of Manhattan from Brooklyn. All became sick on the voyage that lasted months, and a sixth of them died while aboard ship. But when the survivors disembarked, the population of New York City suddenly rose 50%. They constituted the largest single migration to the colony. And with them came the new provincial governor from the British Army in the Caribbean, Robert Hunter. After a threatened rebellion by the Palatines, he took away their weapons and told them either to work or starve. He had brought them here to Gov Hunter's land, you'll see on the far left. 6,000 acres sold back to the government out of the Livingston's Manor of 160,000 acres, roughly 200 square miles on this 1714 survey. The Palatines constituted the first substantial German community in America. In about a decade, some of them became the founding group of the Pennsylvania Dutch. Here's the German town in 1798, a decade after it was recognized as separate from the Livingston Manor. They can be seen to surround it as the towns of Claremont and Livingston, the latter of which still stretched 20 miles eastward to the Massachusetts border. In 1725, the Crown granted to 63 Palatine families the lands that received this survey in 1740. My colleagues, students, and I have been identifying which family got title to what parcels of land, sometimes up to a dozen tracts. Many of these parcels are still bounded this way. And the town of Germantown is approximately half a descendant community. We cross-reference the parcel numbers on that map to deeds of the property in 1741 and after. This key example bears the signature of the person in charge of land division, a Palatine Johannes Hainer, with whose descendants we're closely in touch. The recipient family, whose descendants have a foundation that funds much of our research and student scholarships, and two Livingstons as government witnesses. Now some context about the Livingston family. Robert here, in 1718, founder of the dynasty, was running slave ships to Africa by 1690. His sons and grandsons were major slavers, culminating in voyages of the 1740s to Angola. His great-grandson, Robert Robert Jr., also known as the Chancellor, was on the committee with Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. Yet, 
In 1790, had, together with his mother and cousins, nearly a hundred enslaved people in the lands around Germantown. Here's the central Hudson Valley's four counties. I outlined it first. Each town colored to express the relative size of its African-American population in 1810, when New York's act of gradual emancipation was 12 years in effect. Germantown in the center has the lowest number of all the riverine towns. This may reflect the Palatine's refusal to engage in slavery due to the memory of their own oppression for seven decades, starting a century before. Here are the Central Valley towns in 1860, when rural Germantown shows a relative rise in African-American population, though the other riverine concentrations are all in cities, such as Kingston and Hudson. It's the neighborhood at the Parsonage that makes the difference. Here's the relative distribution of African-Americans in Germantown in 1860, which shows the cluster around the Parsonage. And the same map, 1858, closer up. The African-American population scaled according to the numbers in each household, with the largest group of at the Parsonage in the center of the neighborhood. Here again, in the 1900 photo, with the fence around the well that the person family filled in, near the root cellar, they buried in mid-century. The well or creek nearby or the near distant river may have contained spirits of ancestors that the house's inhabitants had known, were kin to, and whom they call upon for assistance. A new look at the hearth after excavation, which includes the cabinet to its right. Said by the town historian who witnessed the restoration of the house around 1950 to have enclosed the original stairs to the parlor above. Thus the concealment beneath the adjacent corner hearthstone with its crystal incised pebble and iron bars may have also been in a position to catch spirits coming down the chimney as flashes of light like lightning before they ascended the stairs. Those concealments and the figures in the fireplace frame constitute an altar. The cosmogram again, to remark upon its, the dawn moment of the sun and consider that the medicine the person family may have practiced was centered on midwifery and healing, partly the subject of an upcoming thesis at Bart by one of the students here, Cheyenne Cutter. They may have served as generational mediators in the community. A current Bart thesis project, as I had just mentioned, and ad lib there. Recall that educator Bunseki Fukia said, the Bakongo believe we should continuously attend to our own suffering so that we can speak to and act on behalf of our community. Next, after some editing, the poster downstairs, or it's in here, I thought we were gonna be upstairs, um, <laughs> will become part of an installation inside the house in the Germantown Heritage Center where I hope you'll get a chance to visit. It's open every Saturday morning, or you can search Bard Archaeology slash Internet Exhibits and see it there soon. So my thanks to the PR departments at Bard and the BGC for getting word out about the symposium and to the audience of this presentation in the hope that you will provide a closer look, raise questions, and provide feedback to help convey more meanings. If I have time, I'll read this as well. Uh, thank you to Meredith Lynn and Laura Minsky, my colleagues and students at Bard College and in Dale on Hudson. Community college colleagues in Germantown, especially its history department. Don Cruz, notable author of the children's book, Big Mamas, 
about a trip to see his grandmother in Cottondale, Florida, and Nadine Rumke with the Alexander and Marjorie Hover Foundation of Germantown, plus the Mohican Nation, especially Representative Steve Comer and Bonnie Hartley. Thank you. Thank you.